Hello. So, just by the title of this video, I'm sure a lot of people are very interested in just um, hearing a little bit about Afro-pessimism. I've been wanting to discuss Afro-pessimism for quite some time in a more simplified way, if I can make it as simplified as I possibly can. Just for some of my background and to keep people listening, um, I, my name is Edzi. I am a Afro-Indigenous Asian identifying. Um, I'm trans uh, and I don't identify as an Afro-pessimist, but um, I fucks with the ideology pretty heavily. If I will, would identify as any particular political school of thought, it would probably just be anti-authoritarian. Um, but yeah, I guess since there's been more conversations and topics on the subject, I have been really wanting to just have some add-ins and even responses to some of the things that I'm seeing online, specifically on YouTube, from other people having these conversations about, you know, Afro-pessimism and um, just dispel kind of myths. Because regardless of what people say, um, in, in their responses, I think there really is a misinterpretation of, of um, what Afro-pessimism is. Just, so just some background um, briefly on myself. I have been pretty much organizing, community organizing and doing mutual aid for the last decade and really dedicating a lot of my life um, time and energy and influence on trying to foment political resistance and resistance culture against just forms of oppression, uh, pretty much all forms of oppression. And in that, uh, through praxis, whether it be mutual aid, direct action, participating in my community, transformative justice attempts, I uh, have done a lot of readings, you know, I think anyone that wants to begin participating in social movements, you gotta read and you gotta have conversations with your friends, loved ones, comrades specifically, so that you can continue learning. So I'm still learning, you know, I don't know everything. I'm trying to come about this in a very like non I guess academic way. There probably will be terms that I might use that might go over some people's heads that aren't academics or scholars. I personally don't identify and am not a, an academic or scholar. A lot of the jargon that I have learned is through, you know, practice as well as, uh, you know, just participating within uh, movement spaces. So I picked up a lot of the, the speak and the jargon. I bring that up because I think when I first came across uh, Afro-pessimism on Tumblr, I watched a speech by Jared Sexton, I think I wanna say in 2013, it could be 2014, but I didn't understand a word of it. I was like, wow, like, Wow, I was just really um, just like it was the first time time I came across like somebody talking where I was like I have no idea what the fuck this guy is saying. But I revisited it like you know just through struggle and conversation and readings and more conversation and learning vocabulary and expanding my vocabulary uh, through readings and through zines. Zines were a huge effect on my political uh, just awakening and analysis of sharpening my perspective. And eventually I got to the point where like maybe a year later, I was like, whoa, I, I actually attended a, um, 
a kind of seminar, I want to say. Uh, what's the fancy word that they use for it? It's like a, a symposium. So I attended a symposium with Jared Sexton. A few years back, back I uh, helped organize a liberation school where Frank Wilderson was actually, with the help of a comrade, he, uh, a woman who had been his student, two of his students actually um, had uh, brought him to uh, Black Lives Matter political educations and then also brought him again to um, this liberation school that uh, some of us had been facilitating. <clears throat> and um, first of all, I think the conversation of Afro-pessimism is way too dominated by Frank Wilderson. Frank Wilderson himself in one of those spaces said from his own mouth, he was like, I didn't actually even invent the word Afro-pessimism. It was actually Sidia Hartman who um, coined the term. And that stuck with me. So, you know, and even though like, there's certain people that don't necessarily like identify with Afro-pessim, like it really, it really kind of doesn't matter. Um, I think there are people that can like have these like really intense ideas and like it's more of their actions and what uh, their actions uh, actually say about the things that they're doing really says true to like how and who they actually are, um, not the things that they like might spout or an, and identify with. I know that's interesting coming from a trans person, but I feel that way specifically about um, political ideologies and political philosophies, um, not gender. So I have been in these spaces um, and listening and learning and gleaning, you know, and I really felt like a lot of my writing has been influenced by AP. Um, and the reason why I feel like I was able to viscerally understand it and I was really excited about it was because I was also back in 20, uh, 20, 12 to throughout I um, have been really reading a lot of conversation on anarchism and indigenous philosophy and green anarchism specifically and how that you know has uh, this kind of like critique of civilization and indigenous perspectives that have a critique on Western civilization and you know, obviously Black Studies also has that critique of Western civilization as well. So I was very excited upon coming across um, Afro-pessimism and I guess, you know, it, it to, to, be, to be as frank uh, as I can be about the um, perspective or school of thought. I think Afro-pessimism is really a question. Like it is a, it is a questioning and interrogation um, of the structures that facilitate anti-blackness. And it is really how it can actually actively shape how we organize is it is pointing out how important it is to not be assimilated into state power, these coercive state structures that facilitate uh, ongoing anti-blackness. And you know, I think like what wasn't hard for me was connecting the dot between white supremacy and human supremacy. Um, I have some writings on, on the subject. Uh, I, um, yeah, I can post links uh, as well as links to my Patreon um, in the description. But yeah, uh, it's more, you know, acknowledging that anti-Blackness has existed uh, prior to white supremacy. Um, and there definitely are historical connotations and it actually does, you know, calculate the, 
the kind of visceral anti-blackness that people are facing globally. And it's a way to interpret um, what harm has historically been for people who don't necessarily have a foundation in the land, have been themselves propertied to the point where they're, the entirety of their being has been stripped away. That exists uh, and is classified within the constitution. It has existed for thousands of years within the Arab slave trade. Um, and yeah, I think like, it's, it's, a, it's an urgent call to withdraw, to withdraw and disinvest and decruit uh, is what I say, what I often discuss um, in terms of decruitment and decruiting people from the kind of institutions that we are coerced to participate in that strongly reify anti-Blackness. I, I, I have been watching, you know, Marxist takes on uh, Afro-pessimism and I, I think there's a lot of really fascinating um, uh, personal attacks uh, that tend to be very, yeah, devolving into personal attacks is kind of like the oldest kind of weak argument in the book, in my opinion, uh, when you're trying to, um, when you're trying to best somebody. You can always point at someone's personal flaws, their own, you know, background. Like, I thought it, it's really low that people are like, Frank Wilderson is like a, he's a, you know, he's a scholar, he's bourgeoisie intelligentsia, he's not on the ground, what have you. And that, you know, when, sh you know, things pop off uh, and when there is black insurrection, is he gonna be in the streets? What does he have to lose? You know, or, you know, all of these other uprisings that are happening, Roe v. Wade, Palestinian solidarity uprisings and things like that. Like, you know, I don't think um, it's fair and it's a little ableist to <laughs> be like, is he gonna be out in the streets when he's an older person? It's, it's challenging to to just to hear the kind of arguments um against uh you know they they become like really assumption like assumption based for me personally i'm not working right now um i'm kind of like you know i i have job to job like gig to gig i personally don't have like a real stake in like the college academic footing. In terms of my perspective, I have been asked to come and speak at colleges or I have been asked to write for things, but I really don't find my grounding in academia. I don't believe in academia. So there's all sorts of people who are uh, agreeing uh, with Afro-pessimism who aren't necessarily uh, even Afro-pessimists themselves or who come from all kinds of class backgrounds. And I think also the reason why, you know, people fail to highlight capitalism is because capitalism, as it has been overly, how there has been like a kind of oversaturation and what I call Marx washing of um, the interpretation of struggle, uh, especially for people who might not have been able to read my ancestors, whether they're Black or Indigenous or Filipino, not having to have a sharp Marxist or other dead cis white European analysis in order to uh, free themselves uh, from being either uh, genocided or propertied by these Western authorities in power, I think it's really it's really fair to have uh, criticisms of just Western domination and uh, Eurocentrism and political economies that might be imposed on people who don't agree with said political economies, right? So I think what Afro-pessimism has done and uh, is it has allowed Black people, specifically Black people who have 
uh, descended from slaves, um, a an opportunity to understand, just to name the kind of suffering or absence from the kind of selective compassion that humanity cries about. Um, Cause it's, you know, again, in the constitution that we're still living under, you know, uh, we're having to follow this kind of like scripture that dictates our everyday lives. Within that, it still acknowledges or does not acknowledge Black people as human. Afro-pessimism has a, a really, really amazing and beautiful way at like acknowledging that, you know, like why, why are we actually trying to fight to be seen as human if we have never been treated as such? And in terms of, you know, critiques on human supremacy and how there are other indigenous philosophies in the entire um, world. There's other indigenous people who actually don't center themselves, who believe that, you know, just because they are upright, bipedal walking or human or whatever, that they can claim authority over nature in so many other indigenous cultures pre-colonization that are under threat of being completely and forever wiped out. There's indigenous uh, perspective that believes that we are one with nature, that, you know, knows that everything that we have, every, you know, thing that helps us actually survive is, is because of nature. And there's so much that Western philosophies uh, do that try to separate us from that. So my interpretation of Afro-pessimism is a critique on humanity, uh, human supremacy, white supremacy, uh, the, the kind of uh, political economies that were framed within the imaginings of white supremacy. Um, and that, that can very much help us to survive what is coming. I think what the the conversations that I was seeing online about Afro pessimism were just really like off. And I think it's I think what is hard for me uh, for me as a black person or from what I can understand is it's cha it's like, you know, I I definitely grew up thinking like, you know, with this like multiculturalism attitude, there were interesting like there were ruptures of gender and like um, racism that I experienced. I couldn't uh, see what racism was for, yeah, for what it what it really was, just like on a on a larger scale. I think if I was introduced to Afro pessimism back then, <laughs> when I had like this kind of liberal multiculturalist framework, I feel like I would feel like it's almost like race. It's like, whoa, you're saying that I am a slave or that I am always going to be interpreted as a slave to anyone that isn't black. And that my suffering is like always gonna be and always has been like, that sounds really fatalist. And that's, you know, it, I think like in uh, Frank Boulderson's book, um, I I don't wanna harp on about <laughs> Frank Boulderson. But, you know, I, you know, I appreciated um, one of his latest books, uh, Afro-Pessimism, because he was actually talking about how much he struggled with this, this kind of school of thought that he would, or the kind of conclusions that he was drawing. And I had a really great conversation with one of my, another, T-girl, um, black trans woman, um, recently and how she was like, yeah, sometimes we come to the conclusions at different times. And I think a lot of people aren't only coming to the conclusion that white supremacy is, you know, global, but also that there is a separate insidious 
unconscious collective interpretation of the world that is causing our suffering and and really always has i think there there there's a little bit of misinterpretation and like yes you could do all the readings but i think also what what i found especially in academia i didn't go to college i just did a shitload of organizing um and i would audit some classes that some of my comrades would invite me to and even some of the professors would you know let me audit their classes and i think the the biggest wall is that there really isn't like actual on the ground practice that you can then see like shapes your perspective where you have a visceral understanding of what people are writing and talking about um so yeah like sure you read all the readings or whatever but you might not have experienced anti-blackness in hawaii or in the philippines or in russia or in japan you know you haven't experienced that kind of global suffering or positionality of of anti-blackness something else that struck me of what jared sexton had said in one of his talks uh that i saw was that afro pessimism is just a way another way to interpret suffering by the slave acknowledging that white supremacy is different it has a different connotation and a different root cause than anti-blackness anti-blackness you know it it has historic connotations throughout the world and what's more interesting about it is that the paradox is there isn't an easy way way out of it you know demanding reparations is like well what's you know what's really where is that going to take us if we're we are getting our reparations but we're continuing to use the same kind of guidelines the same relational dynamics that have made us property if we're using these pieces of paper uh with dead white slave owners on them and continuing to use that uh to place value on everything you know we're still we're still encaptured in this anti-black and white supremacist way of relating to one another we're trying to to find new ways of relating to one another and that is what i appreciate about different kinds of social theories or political philosophies it's definitely critiquing humanity if you are a black person or indigenous person who is kind of using these lim liberal frameworks as a way to include yourself into the historical narrative of humanhood why why are you doing that it seems more like that is a historical because you're forgetting the context of chattel slavery genocide the stripping of a and removal often at times of selfhood of identity of agency of real relationships to the land and each other it's really not acknowledging history and i think you know it's probably something that really acknowledges especially in the context of the americas and how it's such a superpower why are we trying to be included why do we want inclusion into something that has always historically been anti-black what i haven't heard from other uh, people who have critiques or anger at Afro-pessimism and why it's taking steam and all that is they're failing to acknowledge institutional power. I think Afro-pessimism challenges and disrupts really the intention behind wanting to co-opt, seize, assume, even want this coercive state power because all states are oppressive all states would be anti-black even if and when we've seen black people 
have complete state control, there isn't really, there isn't a freedom from the regulation of the state. Um, and that kind of regulation is always interpreted by anti-Black property owning sentiments. Um, so just proprietary sentiments themselves have a history in anti-Blackness as well. And I think it's, it's really powerful because that alone can help you shape your praxis. That alone can help you on the ground figure, hey, like how about instead of opting into these damn institutions that have historically oppressed us, we do something ourselves. We organize, you know, our own anything, you know, whether it be resolving conflict, food, propagation, land defense, stewardship, feeding each other, you know, responding to these disasters, we can actually do that ourselves. In lieu of opting into a historically oppressive institution or allowing this institution to do that, you know, for us, I think it's really helpful in shaping people's actual practice. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of the the people, the, the scholars who are behind it, I think they get too much credit, you know? Um, I myself am like, you know, steal that shit. Like, they don't own it. I think if you take it and you apply it to people on the ground, which is what they, kind, they want, I don't think any of these people are sincerely like, oh, I wanna see, you know, Black people continuing to suffer. <laughs> and be harmed. I don't think they want that. And some of them have really rad backgrounds, you know, in even within the schools themselves. And some of them believe that the school shouldn't, should no longer be because they know that it's also part of just the anti-Black uh, collective unconscious um, and institutions that facilitate that kind of Black suffering and or Black Black absence from the conversation of humanity and agency and selfhood. So I often feel like sometimes some of these people who wax on about their specific, like, what's the best ideology to get behind? Sometimes I feel the cognitive dissonance lies within their egos. Because, you know, some of these scholars, myself, like, people have had liberal ideologies and have then went from them and sophisticated the way they interpreted the world. Some of them used to even be Marxists themselves. Um, and my thing is like, these old dead white people, old dead cis white men who were interpreting the world, like, yes, maybe not, it doesn't all apply to us. Maybe having a class analysis it is often weaponized against Black people. And that's why we often don't tout cl class analysis as often as we should, because so much of the responses in these spaces, often for 10 years, people were, were significantly always telling me, my, myself, like, oh, it's not about race, it's not about gender, it's about class. And when that's coming from white men, white people, it's really hard to listen. It's really hard to, you know, just wipe identity politics, you know, clean when like they, white supremacy is really the ones who created the identity of oppression itself. And so now it's, it's a gaslight. It's telling us, you know, why are you, making everything about race like it shouldn't be about and that is what people who are oppressive often use against us so it's not like people don't have a, a class analysis it's actually that that has been weaponized against us so much to often your all's own uh, detriment and because of that I think like <laughs> like I I mean like I 100% I think like you know I grew up poor 
I don't, uh, I don't have a lot of like esoteric wealth. Um, I think there are fluctuations like within my life of like poverty, not poverty, poverty, not poverty, never 100% rich. And we can still come to these conclusions even though we aren't sitting comfortable within middle class uh, backgrounds or within the academy or academia itself. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about is which I, I, I have, you know, I reading some uh, of Afro-pessimism, I think for, for some other black friends and comrades I would have conversation with, um, you know, people, yeah, how they interpreted it was like, I just don't like the fact that like people are saying that we're dead like that all oh, black people are just socially dead like you're telling children they're just dead i've always wanted to push back against that as its main you know point um or its main like <laughs> goal and that i don't think you know talking about afro pessimism and social death and how non-black people's social life rests on the social death of black people that we actually have connections to each other and the land and nature and the cosmos i think it's helpful to acknowledge with within us that we don't all see ourselves that way afro pessimism might be missing the mark on that I really love uh, Sidia Hartman's writings, especially her, mo her most recent book, uh, Wayward Lives. I mean, what a what an amazing way to honor um, our ancestors, first of all, um, and like, you know, just honoring the kind of subversive ways that some people who weren't always like seen as like heroes of their time were just living their lives also in my interpretation of afro pessimism is that so much of it is acknowledging that the world the world as we're living in and civil society itself is anti-black and all of the institutions the state the college the schools the courts the prisons all of these institutions, hospitals, hospitals um, they kind of create the world. Afro-pessimists have a very incendiary and insurrectionist viewpoint of looking um, at the world and how if we are to free ourselves uh, from and, and really challenge systemic and institutional oppressions and interconnected systems of domination of which are all embedded with anti-blackness the world as we know it has to come to an end so that we can begin something new and how i interpreted that as obviously abolishing all of these historically white supremacists and anti-black uh, institutions and finding ways uh, to simplify, finding ways to live in real relationship and honor and respect with each other and with the land. And so we're not always having to invest into the political na laziness of having centralized authority embark on this nonstop social control merging of corporation and state facilitating our every waking moment through the imaginings of people who have historically oppressed us uh, powers that often coerce us into these really abusive relationships <clears throat> and you know my crit criticisms again with ap or at least with how some of the some of the black men have used them and wielded them against some women or what have you is that I think intramurally looking from within black communities, yes, we have to establish consent amongst us, but having conversations of consent with the state, that's a moot point when when have we ever when when can we ever 
why why aren't we just trying to end these institutions but i think it's important to acknowledge that you know for people who experience intersecting harms who are you know not only black but also trans disabled fat multiple marginalized identities on top of that of course you're moving through the world in a lot harder uh just compounded in different forms of oppression that um you know they uh talk about double consciousness well it's like what what is what does it mean to be a black trans woman or what does it mean to be a black undocumented um disabled person moving having to operate and navigate a world it brings up interesting conversations of intramurally how we have actually taken on some of these other existing social hierarchies or identities in interpreting that into our own ways so i really think it is important to acknowledge these kind of these social dynamics too, I don't think we should throw that away, especially amongst each other, like cisgendered men, cisgendered black men, like amongst within black community, they have a positionality. I think how non-black people or civil society at large interprets black people is different. It is inherently gender non-conforming you know, Black people generally always will fail at gender when it comes to standards that are set by anti-Black or white supremacist standards. Always gonna fail. Among Us though, I think it's really important to acknowledge how there are positionalities that we very much exist within and how you know we we need to acknowledge it, these uh positionalities because it's being weaponized against us and it isn't helping that you know black cisgendered men are internalizing the kinds of hyper toxic masculinity that are you know used to be slave owners have imposed on us and then you know move through the world wanting to stomp out anything that is subverting uh, the kind of gender norms. You know, femininity or what have you, gender nonconformity, gender subversion has been beaten out of them. So they then have to police, gender police other people, um, especially other black people, especially black trans women and trans femmes. So I just I just wish there was there were more conversations definitely with uh, within AP, but just Black community in general about how notions of gender, notions of class, uh, and sexuality they're all kind of things that we didn't come to these conclusions ourselves. These are teachings we've been indoctrinated through slavery. So many people see slavery as just an era, a kind of era in history that happened that's atrocious. Other Afro-pessimists are begging us to name that it's not so much as a, an era as it is a dynamic. The oldest dynamic that exists before, you know, man and woman, binary, before even black and white before rich and poor, power and disempowered. There has always been these kind of master slave uh, relationalities that are kind of the root causes of um, what, you know, has historically created systems of domination, subaltern categories. And yeah, I mean, I guess that's all I can say about it. It, you know, I have been doing this for a long time. Um, this is gonna, you know, be another another argument against people who are against Afro-pessimism because I'm not the bourgeoisie. I don't have a nine to five. 
um, within, not, and I'm not living comfortably within, you know, the academy. I, I make my money through Patreon. If you learn something from, from what I've been ranting about for the last, you know, hour, uh, please donate to my, uh, cash app or become a patron of mine. I have, um, yeah, I've been wanting to get to the $1,000 uh, mark for quite some time so that with that I could start donating to mutual aid projects that I'm, I know and I'm aware of or am like being asked or informed about uh, to help sustain uh, mutual aid projects because a lot of you don't know me but um, uh, yeah, mutual aid is like is definitely something that I think is going to um, help us realize our autonomy that can collude with a lot of like schools of thought like um, Afro pessimism that can shape not only people's analysis but also create ways we can make specific institutions irrelevant. So that's pretty much it interpreting it as you know a question an ongoing question and interrogating like humanity oh also within my uh patreon um you get access to a lot of different writings um i also have a writing that kind of solidifies in a way it's a little bit more complicated but um i did some writings that uh kind of like speak to what I what I have just talked about I'll leave that link in the description of like how you can get the writing that's pretty much it uh like and subscribe if you want to support me in the future thank you